everyone. So happy to see you all today. My name is Megan Kroll. Um, I'm a member here at CDC, or C- CBC. Um, we've been all hearing too much about CDC. Uh, and and um, I volunteer with um, the Children's Commission and in the, in the nursery. And I just want to welcome everybody, both in person and online. If you all would jump on, share the live stream. Um, and if you're here in person with us, please fill out that connection card uh, in your seat. Uh, this is a great way for us to not only know who's here, but also keep up with um, anyone who needs to share prayer requests um, and make sure that we're praying for those. We all had a great time at Kids Movie Night on Friday. Speaking as a parent, it was great. <laughs> um, we got to go to Target without a child. <laughs> so we definitely appreciated that, and I know everyone who went had a great time. Um, I'm very thankful to everyone who volunteered to make that happen, and I think we've got some photos up there for you to check out. We're going to be doing another one on May 13th, so be ready and join us for that one. If you're a volunteer in the CBC Kids um, Ministry, we invite you to a volunteer appreciation lunch that's going to be next Sunday in the Monroe Fellowship Room. Um, We want to show our gratitude for the impact that you're making on our kids, um, and also talk about what we're praying for for the coming year, or the the year that we're in. (laughs) CBC is hosting a men's prayer breakfast on February 26th at 9 a.m. Um, in the Monroe Fellowship Room. Join with other men in our church um, and worship and share a meal together. So to sign up, you're going to visit our website, clarksorbaptistchurch.com slash men's breakfast, or contact Dan Harbaugh. Um, please sign up by February 21st. And if you signed up for the men's life group with Jared Marazzi, he has your books so you can see him after service today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad you're here today. Let's stand and lift our voices up. We're going to sing about God's consistent faithfulness and how he never fails us.
This morning, amen? Hey, you may be seated. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our children. Uh, we've got our kids' church headed out this direction over here. We've got the loft all the way there in the back. And if you came in late and didn't get a chance to uh, check your kids in, uh, we are dealing with the second part of Respond with the Gospel, and it is a little bit about intimacy. Now, if they're in sixth grade and stuff like that, you'll probably be okay. But if you don't want to have some weird conversations later on, you might want to go ahead and make sure your kids are in the kids' church in the loft. Uh, so we're excited about that. Hey, go ahead and look around. Say hi to someone near you. Good to see a full sanctuary this morning. See each one of your faces. We're going to go ahead and head into our time of worship that we know as the offering. And uh, we want to thank you so much for taking uh, care to tithe and, and give your offerings uh, here at Clarksburg Baptist Church. Uh, we are in a good financial position, which is so weird to say, coming out of some weird years that we've had. God's been good to us, and we want to thank you for continuing to give here at Clarksburg Baptist Church. You know the ways in person here with our little black boxes on both end, uh, ends of the sanctuary, also online through the app. Uh, there's so many ways to be able to do that. And we also want to make sure that you remember that for the month of February, our Above and Beyond is for One King Sports, uh, which uh, I get to take advantage of by being able to serve through them, uh, get to coach. And it, man, it's a tough thing being a coach. Now, y'all, if y'all are mean to your coach, your kids' coaches, you need to calm down because there's a lot of pressure on them. <laughs> no matter what happens, I feel like, man, why, I should have done better. Uh, but it's an awesome uh, place for kids to come and learn that God loves them, that they have value, and that Jesus died for their sins, and also to learn just uh, all the different uh, good lessons that sports teach us. So if you want to give to that, you can uh, do it on the drop-down menu on the giving to the above and beyond, or you can just write that on your envelope as well. So let's pray, and we'll jump into the next portion of our service. To every Father, God, we love you. God, we thank you. Uh, God, you've just given us so many reasons to choose to praise through our storms and through our trials. And uh, I pray that you would help us to continually to choose to do that rather than to dwell on the storm around us. God, help us to look to you today. No matter who's here today, I pray that you would give them what they stand in need of. God, call them to yourself and show them uh, how much you are in control and how much you love them and that you can be trusted. Uh, we pray for our offering, God. We thank you for having a giving church, not just uh, here and in the building, God, but giving that extends out into the community and across the world. Uh, pray for our above and beyond this month with uh, the One King Sports, God. I pray you continue to help them to thrive and to uh, continue to reach children with the gospel. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. So today is a very special service. If you notice, Josh is wearing a blazer, and that's your signa uh, you know, the, the good sign that something special is going on. Uh, but today is, is going to be his ordination service. Now, he's going to preach here in just a little while. But if you're unfamiliar with what ordination is, it's a stamp of approval on behalf of a church that someone has the gifts and the qualifications to be a minister of 
the gospel. And you might say, well, he's been working here for, you know, a year and a half. Uh, he finally decided, well, it's a long process, okay? We've got to go through it, and, and COVID set us back a little bit. Uh, but he has gone through all the different questioning and all the papers he had to write and all those different types of things. And uh, so we're excited to be able to recognize that in him. Uh, so before we go any further, we got a couple video messages from uh, Josh's uh, people in his past and in his present uh, that just want to give him a little bit of encouragement today as we take this step of ordination. Hey, Josh. It is a great joy and honor uh, to be a part of your ordination service. And while I certainly would love to be there in person, I'm glad for the opportunity to offer a little bit of a charge to you. I've been able to be part of your life since you were a young man. I've got to see you grow up and uh, I got to see God begin to use you in, in ways you probably never thought he would. I've seen you become a minister, a pastor, a a husband, and while I have to see those things from afar now, it gives me great joy to see what God's doing with your life. So I wanted to offer a little bit of a charge to you today. You know, Paul, when he was commending the Philippians, he told them to the things that you've heard and received and uh, seen me do, he said, do those things. He's telling them, what you've, what you've seen me do, what you've seen and heard from me, do those things. That word do in the Greek is proso, is practice. And I charge you and challenge you to live a life that you can tell your students and, and those around you, the church, your family, to live a life that you can say the things you've heard and seen me do, do those things all pointing to Christ, all pointing to a life of holiness. And I've got confidence in the Lord that he can do that through you, and he will. And I also recall Paul in his final letter to Timothy. He calls Timothy his son in the faith. He is finishing up chapter 4, and he says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith. So not only live a life that, that will be able to be used as an example for a Christ-likeness and leading others to Him, but finish strong, like Paul did. Paul knew his death was coming. He finished strong. Finish strong, my brother. So many start the race, and they never finish strong. Finish strong, brother. I'm praying for you. I love you. Uh, it gives me great joy to see God use you in the ways that he has and great confidence to know that he'll use you in the ways that he will. Be blessed, my brother, and may God bless all that you do. And may all glory and honor go to Jesus Christ. Love you, brother. My favorite thing about Josh is how open his heart is to loving others and the willingness to accept anyone. And also, that if I make any office reference, he can quote the rest of the entire script with me. My favorite thing about Josh has to be his willingness to share the gospel in whatever situation he's in. I have taken and learned so much from him. He's impacted me so much. My favorite thing about you would probably be like, you care about everybody. like. You're super kind, make people. That's a really big part of like being a good youth pastor, and you definitely show. My favorite thing about Josh is that he's willing to help anyone and everyone who needs help, no matter how big the problem is. Next, I have to say, definitely keep the mustache. Definitely, like that thing's fire. I do. You should change it off. Um, I don't like your mustache because it makes you look older and you don't act older. I do not like your mustache because it makes you look older and I don't like seeing you look older. I don't know why. Josh, just keep being who you are, keep being genuine, keep being encouraging, keep being the joyful person that you are. So Josh, you are one of the greatest youth pastors that I have ever met. You're very nice, kind, open, respectful to everybody you meet. 
Okay, and then some encouraging words to give you is just to keep up your passion, your joy about the Lord, and just to be yourself. Bye. Just some encouragement. Um, we just thank you for all that you do for our church, Josh, uh, how great you are with the kids um, and how uh, great it is to be a volunteer for you um, and just to serve with you and the excitement that you bring to kids ministry here. Yes, Josh, we're so proud of you. We love you. Thank you for um, choosing us to be part of your team. And we can't wait to see what God has in store for you. Give up the good work. You got to see there Pastor Dale Prather, who was Josh's middle school pastor and been a part of Josh's life down in Georgia, LaGrange, Georgia, for years and years. And then some of our students get to speak about Josh. I met Josh, I don't know what it's, 10 years ago now, something like that, as he was a 15-year-old boy. Um, uh, after one of my first services preaching as the new youth pastor at Faith Baptist Church in LaGrange, he came up after and said, hey, I really feel like God wants to me to, to be in the youth ministry and to, to be a pastor one day. And I looked at him and said, <laughs> you know, inside I might have said, that's great. But on the, I mean, outside I might have said that. But on the inside I was like, yeah, right. Uh, this, is, this is really going to work out. But God has used his gifts. <laughs> God has used his gifts. And as I began to, to get to know him, you could see uh, that God had called him and that God was working in his life. Now, he had to choose to continually uh, make that choice to serve God, and, um, and he has done that. Uh, he started as an intern, free intern, living in my basement, and then Mike's, uh, Koreski's house, uh, I don't know, a couple months after I started here, and then uh, we're, we're lucky to have Josh. And my only goal with this ordination was to make him cry, so we've already done that. <laughs> Those of you in the back that haven't seen that. Uh, but we're, we're so... Uh, Excited to have Josh as a pastor here at Clarksburg Baptist Church. We are honored and blessed. And if you feel that way, why don't you give uh, just some praise and uh, some... I never thought when I met him as a 15-year-old boy that he would one day be my son's youth pastor, my, my daughter's uh, you know, children's minister, and I'm, I'm blessed to have that. So uh, Mike Koreski, our treasurer at Clarksburg Baptist Church, is going to come and give Josh uh, one last charge before he comes and, and gets to preach after crying for a little while. So it's going to be fun. Hello, everybody. All right. So, Megan, just so you know, if Josh is crying when I look at him, I'm not going to look at him because I don't want to cry, so I might give this charge to you. <laughs> so we'll see what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to take us through uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. As I give this charge to Josh, uh, a little background in 2 Timothy, uh, we find Paul in a prison cell just before his death. Um, he's writing a second letter to Timothy, uh, giving charges to his protege, uh, who Paul often referred to as his son, even though Scripture tells us that uh, Timothy is not Paul's natural son. Uh, I'm sure many of you... Uh, have heard me refer to Josh as my son, jokingly. Um, and that's because when Josh first moved here, he, he and Candace lived with Samantha and I for about six months. And frankly, I think that gives me the right to call him whatever I want to. So <laughs> I'll call him whatever. So let's jump in. Lock it in, big boy. All right. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repuve, <clears throat> reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Josh, preach the Bible. That's what I want you to take most out of that. Um, we want your skills, your positivity, your wisdom, everything you bring to ministry, but we need, what we need is God's word. All people need God's word. Make sure you always give it to them. Lead your flock patiently and lovingly. Rebuke wrong, encourage right, <clears throat> and put God first. Megan, I'm about to come to you. He's crying. As Paul says, be ready in season and out of season. While it may seem easier to preach the truth in places where it's in season, it doesn't make it less important. 
Ensure biblical preaching remains in season here and wherever you find yourself. Preach God's word where it's out of season. Verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when the people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul knew it was coming. These places that appease the flesh are unfortunately becoming easier to find. Biblical truth is very much out of season in the world and unfortunately in some churches. Josh, always resist the temptation to people please. Or as Paul puts it, never become a teacher that is suiting people's own passions. Give people God's word, especially in places where they are holding on to a perversion of it. Do not pursue your own greatness. Don't break a few Gregs to make a Joshlet. Inside joke. Always point to Jesus. Never tolerate barriers being placed between the lost and Christ. Verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So always be sober-minded, meaning controlled, disciplined, calm, thoughtful, serious, and of sound mind. Sounds easy, right? Maintain control and discipline regarding sin, temptation, and your marriage. Love Candace and your family well. We charge you to put them before us. Be calm and thoughtful about the reality of life's trials and hardships. Lean on those willing to share in your burdens, successes, and failures. Keep your hope in Christ, and as Paul says, endure. Suffer well, and bring glory to Jesus in all things. Do the work of an evangelist. Go to the lost and proclaim the good news. <clears throat> Josh, we charge you with these things and commend you to a ministry worthy of Jesus' name because we know God has equipped you for it. We love you, and we're proud of you, and can't wait to see what you do in the future. Come up here and give me a hug. Well, good morning, everyone. Woo! I'm good. I'm okay. Uh, I just wanted to um, take a minute to, to thank you all. Um, those of you who've spoken, those of you who uh, spoke to me through the video, and those of you who just have, have been here for, for me and Candace, you guys are our family. And um, We're so thankful for this church. To celebrate um, where God has taken me is to celebrate my family here who's carried us. So we love you all so much. I'm trying to get through that to start preaching. Because <laughs> Mike told me I have to. <laughs> all right, so uh, uh, let's just go ahead and dive in this morning. Um, Let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll continue our series in the book of 1 Corinthians. God, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful church family. Thank you for your word. God, even when uh, seasons change, we know your word endures forever. I pray that you'd help us to focus our eyes on that this morning. Uh, thank you for this church family, this, this wonderful community. Uh, God, I pray that you would convict our hearts this morning. Help us to have uh, open eyes and open ears, or open ears to... Uh, to hear your word today. Uh, change us. God, we know your, your word can convict us, and I pray that you'd uh, do that in our hearts today. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my God. Thank you. Amen. All right, so this morning we're going to continue our series through the book of 1 Corinthians. Respond with the gospel. Now, the early church in Corinth found themselves conforming to sin of the Corinthian culture. And Paul was helping them to define those problems and then to respond to that problem with the gospel. 
Now, last week, Pastor Phil talked about the first issue, which was division in the church. Now, Paul instructed the Corinthians to pursue unity and reject division like Matumbo. Phil knew. I know you guys were listening to that. Reject division like Matumbo. Pursue unity. See, Corinthian believers began attaching their followership to uh, different leaders in the church instead of Jesus. And Paul reminded them, follow Christ above all else. Reject division and pursue unity. So this morning, we're going to talk about something a little bit easier and more comfortable. Sex. (laughs) That's great. Uh, Last time I preached, uh, those of you who've watched me preach several times know uh, I sweat a lot when I preach. And last time I preached, I made a vow to myself. I said, I'm only going to preach in like light t-shirts from now on. And that way, you know, I'm going to carry a hanky up here. I'm going to make sure I'm good to go. Fast forward a few months, I'm preaching my ordination service in a blazer, talking about sex. (laughs) And my family's in the room. So this is great. But no, like sex can be a tough topic to talk about in the church, but it's in the Bible, and it's in the Bible for a reason. The Bible has a lot to tell us about sex, and uh, most of the reason it can be uncomfortable to talk about in church is simply that we don't talk about it, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, I've heard pastors who are a little irreverent in the way they talk about it. But this is in the Word, and the Bible has a lot to say about this. And like Paul wrote in Timothy, preach the word, stay true to it, and uh, we're going to ask God to reveal something to us this morning. Uh, So sex had brought problems to the church in Corinth, and we deal with those same issues in our society today. So thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about it, and Paul says a lot here in 1 Corinthians. Uh, So the Corinthians were actually known for being a very highly sexualized society. And this had trickled into the church. Some scholars say uh, the term Corinthianized was actually used to describe someone who was being sexually deviant. So they actually had a word created for this. If you became sexually deviant and uh, kind of loose with your morals there, they would say you had become Corinthianized. So you could say this was a big problem in the church. And Paul is reminding them this dangerous sin that they were normalizing and rationalizing, it was a big deal. And there was a lot at stake uh, here in the church of Corinth. So Paul defines the problem, and he responds with the gospel. Uh, This issue is addressed in chapters 5 through 7. We're not going to read all of that. Some of you are like, thank God. you know. Uh, We're not going to read through three chapters, but I encourage you to go read further on your own or in your life group this week. But we're going to be covering uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. Let's begin reading. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, some of you say, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written all the way back in Genesis, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, 
whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Sexual integrity matters for the Jesus follower. Simple as that. Sexual integrity matters for the Jesus follower. See, Paul lists all of these sins that keep us from God's presence and reminds them, this is not who you are. This may have been who you were, but no longer. He says, such were some of you, but you have been washed, sanctified, and justified by Jesus. In other words, that used to be who you were, but not anymore. Remember who you are and walk as a new creation. The first thing he says there, you've been washed, washed clean, white as snow, all of your sin covered by the blood of Jesus. I love the old hymn that says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Sin stained us, but his blood saves and sustains us, washing us clean of sin and guilt. The second thing he says there, you've been sanctified, set apart, made to be growing in the likeness of Jesus through following him. See, those who are in a spirit led pursuit of Jesus will not find themselves actively pursuing sin at the same time. Third thing he says there, you've been justified. You've been justified. See, the word justified means to be declared righteous. Through Christ's death on the cross, he declared us to be righteous. No longer under the bondage of our sin. If you've ever heard me preach, I use this verse every single time. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. It is through his finished work on the cross. You and I have been declared righteous, no longer condemned for our sin. You've been uh, washed, you've been sanctified, and you have been declared righteous. So walk in step with that new identity. Live a life that properly reflects who you are in Christ. You'll see in that passage of Scripture we just read, Paul quoted a couple different phrases. First he said, all things are permissible. And then he says, and uh, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. It's important we realize here, Paul isn't actually affirming these statements. Okay, Paul is actually a pretty sarcastic guy. And he was actually writing this in sarcasm. He's using them before uh, responding to each of them with truth. Clearly, the Corinthians had been using these slogans to justify their sexual sin and their immorality. And Paul is exposing this here. Uh, J.D. Greer explains these phrases were uh, cultural catchphrases, these mantras that were used uh, probably the same way that an American might say, what happens in Vegas? Vegas. That was a test. I'm really disappointed in you guys. (laughs) But no, we all know that phrase, and uh, this would have been uh, kind of what they were doing there. It was these cultural catchphrases that they used to minimize the sin that they were living in. So they like to say, all things are permissible. But Paul says, not all legal things are helpful and beneficial, and nothing should dominate us as master except for Jesus Christ. Something can be legal and at the same time be spiritually dangerous. We need to be careful not to become slaves to our flesh. Tony Evans says, Liberty becomes detrimental when it negates the law of love, whether to another person or to yourself by bringing you into bondage. Christian freedom should never be used to sin or to harm fellow believers. Paul says in Romans 5 that God's grace is not for justifying further sin. The proper response to grace is a life that's lived in abundance of love for Jesus and what he's done for you. Committed to denying self and following him, no matter the cost. God's grace is not to be taken advantage of to say, hey, God's going to forgive me. I can continue in this sin. No, that is not true. That is not a proper response to God's grace. The second phrase they like to say was food is for the stomach. 
and stomach for the food. Basically meaning when I'm hungry, I can indulge myself to fill that desire as fast as I want to. And that's how they treated their sexuality as well. So in other words, sexual cravings for them were an appetite that they could fill with a quick sexual encounter. They treated sex so casually that feeding this sexual appetite was no different than hitting the drive through and grabbing some chicken nuggets when you're feeling hungry on the way home from work. But Paul says to them, no, that's not how you're supposed to be living as a follower of Jesus. The body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And just as the body of Christ was raised, so will our bodies be raised as well. So your body matters to God. Your body matters to God. It exists to serve the master, not to be served as your master. Paul says you are not your own. Your body is something you steward. It does not belong to you. You are stewarding it for just a few years. Our bodies belong to God. The Corinthian church was also believing the lie that many of us believe as well. That the body doesn't matter and that it doesn't affect the soul. This could not be further from the truth. See, God created sex to be a special and a a spiritual experience. Not just casual encounters for the body alone. As much as society wants us to believe in casual sex, there really is no such thing as a casual sexual encounter. Because sex uh, involves joining physically and uh, uh, the souls together. It's an intimate joining of the souls, and that cannot be done in a casual way. Sex affects the body, and it also affects the soul. It has physical implications and spiritual consequences as well. So don't believe the lie that sex is just a bodily experience. There's something deeply spiritual about sex that we experience on the deepest level of who we are. I love the way the uh, the message translation reads. It says this, there's more to sex than just skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as it is physical fact. Sex joins one with another, uniting two to become one flesh. So if you are with Christ as part of the body of his church. Joining someone in immoral sexual encounters is to join the temple of Christ to somebody in this unrighteous and sinful union. We've got to treat our bodies like they matter. Jesus says that they matter. Remember who you are. Through Christ, your body is being redeemed by Jesus. So what you do with your body matters. Your body matters. Your body is not your master. It does not exist to pursue those sexual desires. But it exists to please and glorify God. See, when you make Jesus Lord, he is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. So maybe you need to ask yourself, have I actually made Jesus Lord of every area of my life? Maybe you're comfortable giving him finances, but you're not very comfortable giving him romance. Maybe you're comfortable giving him your family, but you're not comfortable giving him your career. See, lordship is all-consuming and total, or it is non-existent. He's either Lord of everything in your life, or he's not Lord of anything in your life. It's over all aspects of life, finances, romance, his career, and yes, what you do with your body. Your sexuality. So we can define the problem here. See, the Corinthians had given themselves over to sexual immorality, living to fill desires of the flesh and these bodily appetites that they had. But sexual immorality is just as uh, real and dangerous for us in our society today. And we've got to respond with the gospel. See, the gospel says you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. Jesus came to bring the dead to life, to resurrect our bodies, to uh, be made new, to live with him forever. The gospel says that we were held captive by our sins, but God sent the Savior, his son, to die in our place to declare us righteous, to wash us, to sanctify us, to justify us. 
So we are called to glorify God in return with the bodies that he died to make new. As Jesus followers, we become a temple for the Holy Spirit to abide in. Don't take that lightly. Your body matters. Your body is a temple. The Holy Spirit dwells in you if you are a Jesus follower. When we defile our bodies with sexual immorality, we also are defiling the spirit within us. Tony Evans explains it this way. He says, a Christian's body is a house of worship. Therefore, sexual immorality brings such sin directly into God's presence. Since your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, you are not your own. But Jesus bought you with his blood. We are not owners, but stewards of our bodies. God will call everyone to account for how they manage their sexuality. So glorify God with your body. The gospel says you were bought with the ultimate price. The blood of Jesus to bear fruit that honors God as a new creation, walking in step with who he's called you to be, not living under the command of your flesh, just indulging in those desires as you once did. Before we wrap things up today, I'd like for us to leave with uh, three truths about sex. Some things that I feel like we all need to know before we leave this room today. The first thing, and something we've already alluded to, God made sex to be special, sacred, and spiritual. All the way back in Genesis, when Adam and Eve joined together, Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Sex was made to be experienced within boundaries and guidelines that God set. One man, one woman in intimacy together in a sacred union. Our culture today tells us that sex isn't that big of a deal. right? It should be enjoyed whenever you get that urge to fill your appetite. One of my favorite uh, sermons I've ever listened to about sex was uh, from Pastor Levi Lusco. And he says that the problem with sex is like the problem with pineapples. Kind of a weird... Uh, analogy there. But I'll explain what he means here. See, when pineapples were first discovered on European voyages to the New World, it was unlike anything they had seen before. Before too long, pineapples were so rare and luxurious and special, it was a commodity to come by, and people would pay the equivalent of roughly $800 just to own a pineapple. Some people would even rent pineapples just to put out at their parties to impress their friends. It sounds insane, right? I thought about decorating the stage today with pineapples to see how many of you would be impressed with my ordination service today. But before too long, um, as the demand for pineapples grew, so did the supply. And once the supply outgrew the demand, it lost all of its value. People didn't see it as something uh, that was special anymore. See, something rare and exclusive is desired by everybody. But something that's accessible to everybody is really wanted by nobody. Sex had become so easily accessible, the shine and the splendor of it had faded. And it was treated as nothing more than a cheap snack you'd grab off the shelf on your way out of the grocery store. See, it lost its shine. Once it was accessible to anybody, it became where it wasn't special at all. But it was never meant to be this way. God made sex to be special, sacred, and spiritual. The second truth I'd love for us to come away with today is this. Sexual sin will haunt you and those that you love. Now, some of you listening today know this well. Maybe just hearing those words, or it's kind of... uh, you know, digging out a wound that you've had in your life for a while. Maybe it was an affair that was opened up in your marriage or uh, one that left your marriage in ruins or a porn addiction that caused strife and tension and distance between you and a spouse or a loved one. See, sexual sin affects us, but it also affects those around us. It affects our relationships. It brings them to ruin. 
Now, you may think you've got your sin under control. But left in our control, sin is never tamed. See, James says in uh, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sin always leads to death. Death is always the result and the consequence of sin. It starts with that desire, something that looks enticing. I just uh, was nerding out with my dad uh, yesterday talking about, uh, we, we love nature documentaries. Okay, I know I'm a nerd. Okay, But we were talking about those fish, they're angler fish, and they have that little light that comes off their head. Maybe you're familiar with it from Finding Nemo. Okay, He made an appearance in that as well. Uh, but what they do is they live so deep in the ocean, it's so dark, and they use that light to lure and entice smaller fish. And before you know it, they're standing in front of this fish with teeth scarier than anything I've ever seen before. And he eats them up. That's how sin works. It looks enticing. It looks desirable. It draws you in, and then it leaves you dead. It may be a little pet sin you just kind of play with every now and then, and you think you've got it under control. But sin grows, and it always brings forth death. I love the way Ben Stewart says, he says, small compromises lead to major consequences that compound beyond our control. Small compromises lead to major consequences that compound beyond control. I recently read a story about a man who adopted a baby hippo, and he began to raise it on this 400-acre farm. They taught young Humphrey the hippo to swim in the river, and they fed him, and he, uh, before too long, was just one of the family members, right? That's just Humphrey. At full adult size, after raising him for a few years, weighing over a ton, Humphrey the Hippo violently mauled and ripped apart his owner. Sorry if you were waiting for a happy ending to that story. (laughs) It ended rather abruptly. This guy was mauled to death and ripped to pieces by the very thing that he raised. See, he had been warned multiple times not to get involved. But he thought he had it under control. He thought, I can take care of this. I can tame this. Until the very thing that he nourished and raised became his undoing. This is a painfully accurate illustration of what sin looks like for us. We keep these little pet sins. We convince ourselves they're harmless. I can keep this under control. It's all going to be okay. But we nurture and we raise them and we give them room to grow until they become our demise and wreak havoc on our lives. You may think you have your sin under control. You do not. It will ruin your life. It will ruin your spouse's life. It will ruin the lives of people around you. It will affect you and your relationships. It starts as a baby, right? I got a picture of a baby hippo up here somewhere. Yeah, it's cute, right? For a couple years. Okay, it starts as a baby, a small desire that you might bend to occasionally. And in time, it becomes a monster that will tear your life to pieces. See, sexual sin needs not to be taken lightly. Paul wrote for the Corinthians to flee from it, run, put as much distance between you and that sin as you possibly can. He doesn't say stand strong and endure sexual temptation. He doesn't say, uh, be more persistent and try harder. See, he knew sexual sin would unravel their lives and their relationships. So he says, run, flee from it, leave it behind. Don't look back. It will destroy your life. See, sin compounds over time. It becomes impossible to control. So fleeing from temptation the first time is so important. The best place to fight temptation Those of you who have struggled with this, you know this. The best place to fight it was back then, right? Once it's grown and become this thing that you can't handle, it feels impossible to fight. The best place to fight it was back then. Make smart decisions today. Run from it. Flee from it today. Ben Stewart says to avoid sexual sin, we need to do these three things. Be a student of your environment. 
Are you putting yourself in situations to fall? Be a steward of your curiosity. See, he says most people who fall into sexual sin, it starts with just a little bit of curiosity. I wonder where this link leads. I want to know a little bit more about my coworker. How about we start this email chain? And that one thing leads to another. Be a steward of your curiosity. And the third thing he says is to be submissive to accountability. Can you think of anybody in your life who can step up in front of your face and say, hey, I think you're moving the wrong direction. I've noticed this about you. I think you need to uh, cool it. I think you need to repent of this thing. Do you have anybody in your life to speak that truth to you? Student of your environment, a steward of your curiosity, and be submissive to accountability. I'm going to invite the band to go ahead and come up as we start to close things out. The third truth that I want to leave you with today is this. God has grace and freedom for the captive of sexual sin. God has grace and freedom for the captive of sexual sin. See, someone listening today, you might feel despair or hopelessness. You feel like you've already messed up too much. That God's grace can't reach the depth of your sin. You're too far gone. You're too bad. That's a lie. That is not true. See, there is no sin so deep that His grace is not deeper. You cannot be so far gone that God cannot reach you with His love. Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounds... Where sin exists and grows, His grace abounds all the more. Maybe you need to preach that to yourself this morning. Maybe you've been carrying around some uh, guilt and some shame. And you need to remind yourself, my sin might be big, but God's grace is bigger. My sin might be deep, His grace is deeper. He can still reach you. You can't undo anything you've done. That's a fact. But Christ died for all of it. He died for every sin you've committed, or committing now, will commit. He died for all of it. To cover it up. To make you righteous. You can run to the Father this morning. Receive grace like no other. Receive arms that wrap around the most broken people. Receive a relationship that's not uh, built on what you've done, but on what Christ has done for you. See, maybe you feel despair this morning. Maybe you feel like it's too late, but it is not too late to say, from this day forward, Christ is Lord of all of my life, including my body, and I'm going to live a life that reflects who He calls me. I'll be a temple that exists to glorify and bring fame to the one who saved me where there is uh, sexual sin and immorality, Paul encourages us, respond with the gospel. See, God's given us guidance on how the gospel responds to sin and what we do with our bodies. He has another way. He has boundaries and guidelines that lead to the avoidance of guilt and shame and insecurity. He gives us the guidelines to treat sex the way He intended And the gospel reminds us, we have been washed, sanctified, made righteous. So do not walk in that life anymore. Walk as a new creation. See, sexual immorality has no room to be master of our lives when Christ is on that throne. You were bought with a price. Not to be free with your bodies, but to commit them back to Christ. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. It's a heavy message. It's a hard thing for us to talk about. But we've got to be honest about this. The Bible says so much about this. Your body matters. What you do with it matters. There was a sin problem. But Paul responds with the gospel. 
He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Maybe you've never heard this gospel message before. I want you to hear it this morning. The gospel is Jesus in my place. The gospel says where we were dead and broken in our sin with no way out, God made a way through his son, Jesus, that he loved you so much. He sent his son, Jesus, to come to this earth, live the perfect life that you couldn't and die the death that you deserved on a cross. And through that death, he declares us to be righteous as he takes our sin onto himself. I want to challenge you to accept that message this morning. Maybe you're already a a saved and born again believer. But you just need to preach the gospel to yourself more frequently. And remind yourself daily, it is not based on what I do. It's based on what Christ has already done for me in my place. That is the gospel. It is Jesus in your place. Jesus on the cross for you. Taking on our sin to make us righteous. I challenge you this morning to respond to that message. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You can do that today. You can say, God, I'm done living for myself. I'm repenting of my sin and I'm turning to follow you. Maybe you've never made that decision today. You can do that today. You could say, God, I'm... I'm so, I'm done living in sin. God, I'm giving you my life. I'm making you Lord of all. I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to you. If you want to make that decision or if you did make that decision today, we challenge you to write that on a connection card. We'd love to know that Jesus became Lord of your life today. Or maybe you just have some questions. You're not really sure you're ready to make a decision like that. Write that down on your connection card. We'd love to get with you. We'd love to uh, get to know you better. We'd love to help you wrestle through some of those questions. I challenge you as we continue to worship today to respond to this how God leads Maybe it's in repentance. Maybe it's in worship and praise for what Jesus has done for you. Respond to that message this morning.
resurrected King is resurrecting me by your Spirit. I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name, I come alive to declare your victory. Resurrected King. each and every one of us to guard our hearts and our minds. Uh, such a, an easy thing for us to drift away from what God intended. He gave us this amazing and holy thing called sex, and uh, when we indulge and uh, go too far with it, we become uh, people that are hurting ourselves and hurting each other. And, and I loved how Josh also uh, let us know that regardless of what is in our past, don't believe the lie that once you messed up, you have to double down and triple down and continue to be in that. You can today choose to be pure and holy uh, inside the confines of marriage or one day uh, in that. So uh, thank you, Josh, for that challenge today. Uh, perfect message for an ordination because that's that out-of-season stuff that nobody wants to talk about, right? And that's a difficult message to preach. So uh, we're going to do one last thing uh, here before we uh, close out. And uh, let me read uh, some verses here in Acts 13.1. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Ordination is not something we take lightly. This is a time when people have noticed gifts in someone's life. And they say that as a church, we are going to set this person apart for the ministry, the work of the gospel. 
There are gifts that needed to be affirmed and qualifications that need to be met and questions that need to be asked. It's more than just an honor. It's a huge responsibility. It's more than just talking on stages. It's pastoring people through the darkest times. It's stepping into difficult situations that no one else wants to deal with. It's responding with love and forgiveness when people are cruel and critical. Being a pastor is an amazing privilege, but it's also a difficult responsibility. And Pastor Josh Weddle has gone through each one of these steps uh, and been recognized as having these gifts. He's gone through every step with the West Virginia Baptist Convention Ordination Committee as well. So today we're going to invite Josh up here and present Josh with his ordination papers, and then we're going to lay hands on him and pray. So we're going to invite also, I didn't tell him this, but Josh's parents to come up. Uh, and join us on stage. Josh, you're going to he- stand here in the middle. And take here your uh, ordination papers. And also, we want to invite anyone that is a deacon or, or former pastor or current pastor, if they want to join us on the stage as well. Yeah. Yeah, come on up, Miss Candace. You're part of this as well. And then lastly, anybody that feels... Uh, like they have recognized uh, these gifts in Josh and also uh, is committing to encourage him and to hold him accountable uh, to come up and pray as well, if you want to join us as well. So we invite you uh, to pray with us and over him as well. So we're going to have Just a few minutes of uh, prayer, and then I'll close this out here at the end. Uh, But we're praying for protection, because this is a difficult thing, and we see people fall all around us. People uh, get entangled with sin and uh, get, get pulled out of the ministry. We need to pray for encouragement. It's incredibly difficult at times to be a pastor. There's depression and anxiety and things that come along with that as well. And then pray for boldness, because... Uh, This is uh, countercultural. The message of the gospel is not the message of society today, and it's difficult to remain strong in the midst of cultural pressure. So you join us in prayer uh, from where you're at, and we'll pray as well as you lay hands on Josh, uh, and you can just gather in that way, and Candice as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray over uh, Josh and Candace, God, as uh, they're together in this ministry, Lord. Um, As we send Josh out to do the work of the gospel, I pray you protect him. God, keep him from sin. Um, And the pull of this world that tries to distract us uh, from the gospel and, and, and your word, I pray that you encourage him when he is discouraged. I pray you help us as a church to continually to exhort him and to lift him up um, and to let him know that we're in his corner uh, so that he might go and and do amazing things for you. God, I also pray that you help us to hold him accountable, Lord, uh, when his eyes are off of you. Um, God, I pray that we continue to commit to pray and to, to be there for Josh and Candace and to be the family that we're supposed to be. God, as we send him out, Lord, I pray that you would embolden him and do great things, for, not for his glory, God, but for your glory. We love you so much, God, and thank you uh, for this church and this moment. In your name we pray.
Amen. Amen. We're going to send Josh and Candace down to the cafe, and uh, Vaughn and, and Angie, if you'll join them as well. Uh, it's uh, over that way, Josh. That's the direction. It's that one. Right He's going to be down there. We've got some uh, treats and snacks down there and some coffee as well. Uh, so uh, as we let them head out and get in front of everybody, go and encourage him. Let them know you're going to pray for him and you're committing uh, to stand with him uh, and hang out there for a minute. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us at Clarksburg Baptist Church uh, today. Thank you those of you online. Uh, we are so honored to be part of your family here. And man, it's, God is good, isn't he? Amen. Let's, let's stand and we'll be dismissed in one last word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, as we are uh, sent out into this world, God, I pray you help us to remember that we are missionaries into this community. God, I pray that we would bring hope, we would bring healing, God. I pray that we would be a light in the dark world that we live in. God, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.